My name's Ralph Copenhaver. Well, I've been training horses probably for uh, 50 years. Started back when I was in high school. Then from high school, I went into probably 1960. I uh, went training with uh, Bill Horn and Dale Wilkinson, but back in the 60s and 70s. Then uh, quit for a while, and we went back training probably about 11 years ago at Hannah Creek Acres. Uh, we was raised on a horse farm back in uh, Germantown, Ohio. Uh, my father started that, and uh, we started probably when I was seven, eight years old, riding horses. Then when I got a little bit older, probably in junior high school, we started showing horses. Then uh, when I was in high school, we started showing uh, rest of quarter horses all over the state of um, back east. And uh, probably had one of, some, one of the best farms in Ohio at one time, quarter horse farms. My dad was quite a horse person himself. He was the uh, president of the Quarter Horse Association and he's one of the men that started the Quarter Horse Congress. Back in Ohio, we won a, a lot of state championships uh, with our quarter horses. Uh, when I was a youth, we probably won the, we, we won the top youth in the state of Ohio several years, top 4-H. Then, I, then adults, I, I won some reigning classes, good sized reigning classes, and I won some fraternities, pleasure fraternities, two-year-olds, uh, won some all-arounds. Uh, here at Hannah Creek Acres, we, we bought Hannah Creek uh, probably about 11 years ago. And uh, we started out uh, uh, boarding horses and we got into training a lot more horses here at Hannah Creek. And we also, we do a lot of teaching. Uh, we teach a lot of young kids and some adults. And we use our own horses. And uh, we teach all the kids about feel and how to be gentle with the horses. Point it out, your heels down, and sit up straight, don't slouch. You'll have to guide your horses. I want you to feel them. When you feel those horses slowing down, I want you to take trot or flip to them, okay? Keep it moving. Don't let them break gate. They break gate, they break off. Don't let them break gate. Good. Good job. Yeah, you know, kick your feet out of the stirrup. Okay, hand top. Sit so down around the the barrels. Good. Good job. The other 
you can just keep on the rail and try. Yep, back on the rail. I teach a lot of feel. I teach the kids to ride barebacks. Uh, I teach the horses to uh, feel their horses' shoulders and feel their bodies and feel their hips. And uh, teach them how to be kind and love their horses. Uh, I kind of pattern my training program around uh, kindness and feel of the horse. And uh, getting a lot more done with them by teaching the horse on a slow basis and being gentle. By feel, I mean by uh, like you have to learn how the horse moves and how the horse is doing, uh, how, how the horse's reaction. Uh, as soon as you learn that feel and learn to be one step ahead of them all the time, uh, that way you can learn how to control your horse a lot better. Without feel, you're just going on just reactions and pulling and tugging on them. By feeling a horse, you can always be a little step ahead of them because you know what they're going to do before they do it. When you can start feeling your horse move in the right direction, the right feel, the right movements. And that a lot of feel is done by your body, by your legs and your hips. Moving your horse to where you want them. When you get to feel the right, the right way and the horse should be moving, then you pretty much can tell what the horse is doing at all times. I think uh, draws me into it. I've been raised with it all, all my life, and I think the horses are probably one of the, the greatest animals on earth. They're, they're so gentle and, and kind if you treat them kind. Mm -hmm. I think uh, horses has really done a lot for me. Uh, when I was younger, I was a pretty quiet guy. I wouldn't talk a whole lot, and I didn't like to be out in front of a lot of people. But being around horses and showing horses as a young person, they really brought a lot of that out of me. And uh, it got me talking a lot more and, and uh, it's made me a good living. You know, training horses, I think it's a, it's a great job. It's, it's one of the best things I've ever done. I sure enjoy it. I think it's something young people can uh, learn on. People can make a good living by training horses. And uh, that's why I try to educate some of these young people, some of the young riders to go ahead and, and do their advanced training and try to get in a, into it full time learn a lot as much as you can about the equine business and you do that by uh, being around horses and loving it. Well, I, um, when I was a kid, I wanted a horse, um, and I got a horse when I was 10 years old and started riding, and this was in California. I grew up in California and um, started going to, um, you know, local horse shows and gymkhanas and that sort of thing, and when I got to be a teenager, I guess I got um, reasonably proficient, and I, you know, started... Uh, uh, breaking some colts and that kind of thing for um, uh, for people. I rode a lot as a teenager um, through high school, and um, then when I went off to college, I um, kind of quit. Um, I tried to rodeo a little bit, but I kind of quit riding horses. And then um, uh, and then when uh, after Nancy and I got married and we had kids, our kids wanted to ride, and I decided, well, if our kids were going to ride, I was going to ride some more too. I really like riding two and three-year-olds. Uh, Two-year-olds especially I like riding because every day, almost every day, you think to yourself, well, by golly, that horse got a little bit better. This is a three-year-old, and um, 
he is actually more of a reined cow horse bred horse than a, than a reining horse. But since we don't have any cows to chase around, he's going to be a reiner. Um, what I'm what I'm work, what I'm shooting for, I guess, is um, is a futurity horse. A futurity horse is one that is shown as a three-year-old. He is a two-year-old. Um, I first got on him the third of January of this year, so he's got you know a little less than three months of riding on him. I'm trying to get him soft. I'm trying to get him paying attention. I'm trying to get him you know not to be afraid of things. Everything different is something to be afraid of. Some tend to be more afraid of things than others. He's usually not too spooky about things, but he's, see, he's walking up now. <laughs> when horses get older, um, you don't see that as much, and I think that's what I find maybe most difficult is keeping an older horse doing the things that I want him or her to do. You know, if you're not getting better, then you're getting behind. Um, uh, you may, you know, you may think you're a pretty good hand, and you may think that you've had some success, um, but there are always, um, you know, horses are different. Um, there are different ways to get the same result out of um, out of different horses. So getting as much help from you know from other knowledgeable people as you can is really um, um, is really useful. You gotta you know you gotta try to keep improving. Try keep you keep trying different things. You know try to gain from other people's knowledge as well as your own. You know, until you ride a nice horse, you don't know, uh, uh, you don't know what a nice horse is. Um, it's, um, it's, um, kind of action-packed, um, it's, um, it looks amazingly easy when you see it done well, and it's amazingly difficult when you try to do it yourself. Um, you know, you're asking for the horse to be very athletic, and you're asking, and very precise, and in order for them to be very athletic and very precise, you have to be, you know, both athletic and precise, and uh, and um, and and you know, self-critical yourself. You know, if you didn't like horses, probably wouldn't ride them. Uh, I mean, uh, they're a lot of work. It's been fun and rewarding for me to, you know, kind of expand my horizons and as well as um, have some success with with the horses that we've raised and the horses we've trained. I grew up on a ranch in Bernie, Montana. I've been training for the public now for over 25 years, uh, but I grew up on a cattle ranch and grew up rodeoing, um, reining horses, um, just grew up 50 miles from town around horses. And then when I graduated from college, I realized I wanted to train myself. I, uh, my family had horses growing up. Uh, my dad was an aerospace engineer, but we had horses in our yard. And I started with a little pony named Princess and went on to, through the POAs, 
Pony of Americas and then the Quarter Horses and I started in Pony Club jumping a little bit and then uh, I grew up in Castle Rock, Colorado which was very similar to Sheridan uh, that many years ago, a small town and uh, I started with the Little Britches Rodeo and the High School Rodeo and then I decided I liked the jumping more and went back to jumping and um, rode with a few very good trainers but never had a formal training um, and then started a job position with a farm that grew from 30 acres to 2,000 acres from five horses to over 100 horses that were imported from Europe and uh, I worked for them for 15 years and kind of just learn through exposure. I have developed young horses for all disciplines my whole life and as my Colts Unlimited, so that's how it's got its name because I, I used to develop a lot of young horses for these people. Um, it's changed a lot through the years now. It's um, instead of just developing the young stock, we also have the, the quarter horse show string that shows, the warm blood show string that shows at the A-rated shows and then also the, uh, and then all of the amateurs and youth that show with us as well. The horses that are actively showing a lot are usually kept in here because we can keep their, we can control their hair coats with the fluorescent lights. Because I have them on timers so that they think that, basically they think it's July all the time. There's more, more horses in trainings, ones that we don't have to worry about their hair coat. This <laughs> yeah, that's good. This mare has won the Quarter Horse World Championships twice and been reserved once. She's a two-time world champion. We specialize in hunter jumpers here, and hunters is, uh, both of them are horses shown over fences. And the hunters, I guess if you compare it more to like figure skating versus the jumpers being more like hockey. Jumpers is a time and speed. Uh, managing the horses, the welfare of the horses is a daily deal, and managing the staff that we have to feed and clean, and then each horse gets worked in some way. We try to do a lot of what's called cross training, so we school them in the indoor arena. We have the woods out behind when the footing's good, jump jumps there, and then we take them out in the hills and in the hay field and mix that all up and, and keep them fresh and happy to do their jobs. In the, winter, in the summertime, we do all the bathing and the horses get washed and everything out there and tied there to dry and stuff. And there's a path down in the woods that we gallop them on for exercise, and plus we can go out in the hills with them. We use a few smaller local shows, uh, primarily this time of year in the spring, to kind of get people's feet wet to get them more ready for the big shows in the summer. The, the majority of the showing we do in the summer we can get done in Colorado. And you can pick a certain week of each circuit that matches your clients the best. Uh, I'm trying to find um, what their goals are and try to meet them and um, figure out a show schedule that'll work for them and get them there and have them successful and happy and leave happy and come back and work towards the next one. So we don't, we're not on the road all that much. We're gone maybe one week a month. I was going to say the A-rated shows that we go to, the, those have international competitors. They're easily 2,000 horses at that horse show. And, um, but there's divisions that can match everybody in the barn. I really want that. She hasn't left yet. Don't lean yet, right? Don't lean here. Once this leg comes up, you just go like this because she doesn't need her head right here. She doesn't need her head down. That's, you know, you didn't lean. <laughs> but it's, it's allowing that position in the air. We have some really special A-rated jumpers that are showing at a really high level or horses or clients or combinations that we may take to Scottsdale, Arizona, Southern California, San Diego area, um, places like that for specific goals that they're trying to achieve. And then the quarter horse industry is a little bit different. We use the A-rated shows to keep our quarter horses improving and to um, and to present them and prepare them for the, the Congress and the World Championships in Oklahoma City are the big, the big things to win in the AQHA. You're the, you know, you're not the big fish in the little pond, you're the little fish getting, getting it figured out and being successful and we have had a very high success rate. This is a scene from the 13th Warrior where I'm doubling 
Antonio Banderas and I jump over this ox cart and gallop through the water. This is kind of cool. This horse was champion and reserve champion at the Sun Circuit in Scottsdale and this horse is actually the dad of that one. So that was kind of cool. This is me winning the world show on Josh. I won it in 2006 on this horse and I donated that horse when he retired. I donated him to the CHAPS program. This is a really quite famous horse that I used to show. I mean, Kate's a squad car, and he was owned by a saddle and tack company down in Denver, but this was a Grand Prix horse that where you jump in the big, big classes. World Show wins. The gold ones are first and the silver second, obviously, but those are World Championship trophies for the AQHA. And this is for winning the Congress in Columbus, Ohio. That's a big show. You've probably heard of that one. And this is for winning the Hunter Derby at the World Show. And this is, these are for being second at the Congress, these spurs. Here's a world champion and a reserve world champion buckle there. It's as fun for me to see someone your age be really successful with their horse as for me to be successful with one. They learn a lot more out here other than just how to ride their horse. Nice trot, get a little bit from the center. Good, change diagonal. Yeah. You know, it's the old saying, uh, you know, why are there so many uh, talented kids and so many average adults? <laughs> Same thing with horses, you know. Like, you gotta, if you got a talented kid or you got a talented horse, you have to follow through to, to turn them into something. And it takes us as coaches to get that done, and that's rewarding, very rewarding. Go to ask him to walk and go to pet him, and he great morals because they've been so mean, they've been so hard on him. So that was as a five-year-old, you know, and it just took it took all those years to make that relationship. We've had him seven years, and he's done the Grand Prix, and he's done all kinds of things. And and I, I am part owners with him with a lady who, you know, he was an investment and to be sold. And if you put someone else on him, it all comes right back. It yeah. comes right back. And you can't erase history on the horses. But for me, he'll do anything for me. It, you know, sometimes it's really frustrating, but on the other side of you, you're like, oh, look, he likes me so much. Um, but the horse, the horse itself is definitely the, the challenge of, of taking a quality horse and keeping it a sound athlete and making it better every day or fitting that horse with the perfect combination of horse and rider so that, so that they can be unanimously a really a really good unit that can be very competitive is that's really rewarding too. We draw 11 entries 752 Kodak moment shown this evening by Hillary Carroll of Sheridan Wyoming owned by Cameron Pitch of Sheridan Wyoming.
Ike Cadillac Cash with Charles Carroll in the Irons. But in the end of the day, you know, I, I grew up loving horses. And I still do. You, you have to have yeah. that compassion to survive the business and the work and the disappointments and you know, the hard work that goes with it. I love, the, I love horsemanship and I love um, helping people with their horses and everything, but to combine that with, with a sport, and, and show jumping is definitely a sport, um, that's what's kept me really um, excited about it for so many years. In the show ring, when you're winning the class, lasts three or four minutes and uh, there's years behind that victory you know so it's, it's the hard work it's the dedication that that makes it uh, really rewarding raised at a polo club where the polo fields were in a row and my father was a pilot. From day one I got to see good polo and good horses from the time I could, you know, I mean a baby. So then I started working polo ponies just getting to hot walk them at eight, about eight years old and then I got to riding. Uh, of course you're horse crazy so you constantly get on and ride and from then on it just developed into where I I groomed for many, many years for all sorts of levels of polo, and I uh, went all over the country. I had different people that I worked for, but a couple of very special people. And then I met my husband and uh, came up here about 33 years ago, and he played polo. So I've been involved in polo ever since here, a little bit more around the country, and I used to play. <clears throat> I was one of the first women players in the United States. Uh, that they recognized as um, when they allowed women players to come into the USPA, which about 1972 approximately. Uh, and so I've been making and helping make raised polo ponies for, gosh, I don't know, 25 years maybe. I built the horse fiddle about 29, 28, 29 years ago for a business. To do, besides the polo in the summer, I needed something to do horse rise in the winter, and that's developed into a great business, taking care of crippled horses basically, or folding out mares, dealing with horses that have any kind of a problem that the horse, the vet might want me to treat. You work 100%, well, I would say 90% with the vets. If you counted every animal that's here through the year, we have about 65 head as an average. Uh, built the arena about 20 years ago. Uh, that has helped my business because I started boarding horses then. Breeding has developed, thank goodness I had the help of some very, very knowledgeable breeders that had good horses and over the years I bought those horses from them, those stallions. It took me a long time to learn that the best breeding you can do is the very best mares you can get from Polo. They have to have been proven, sound, played, quiet, good brains, everything, good mares. And if you're lucky, you've got a nice stud to match them. You, as I say, you 
You can like your mares, but you better love your stud because he is 50% of everything. And he pulled her out and we put her on a towel and then Mike said, now, you know it's a twin because they're tiny and the mare's huge and she's still huge. And Mike said, can we save the other one? Meaning the big one. Uh -huh. Well, they got in there and that mare, that baby was so malpresented they couldn't. And then of course that baby hadn't been in there right. So she, they put her on the ground and she was actually built fine and they tried CPR and they tried atropine, everything. She just died and we're going, oh. And over here in the corner is the little bony one that's about nothing. She stands up and goes, hello, I'm alive. <laughs> and so she was 37 pounds. Now the average baby is about 60 to 80 pounds born. She was 37, you could hold her in, her hand, in your hand and she couldn't stand up. So we pulled some milk out of the mare and tubed her and got a bottle and fed her for a few hours till that, and then you look in the stall and the next thing you know she's standing up. But her legs were backwards, her knees bent back. So, well, you didn't want them to, but that's how they are when they're not finished. Oh. <laughs> so we got PVC pipe and splinted her so that she wanted up. We've done this a million times with weak babies, but not with one that was 37 pounds. We, that was a week ago today. And she went, she is 60 pounds now. We're hoping that it'll only take another week for her knees to toughen up. And we're just hoping that then she will be so correct that we can fill her full of feed and then have her big enough to play. Take over and that she'll, we're hoping she likes that ball. We just threw it in here for something for her to do. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. She's trying to step on it. That's great. I don't, that way they're not, you know. Yeah. We have big polo balls like that up in the arena that we hit with. And he said every horse should have blood and everything as good as this baby. She was wow. that healthy. healthy. We are so lucky. A lot of the breeding is when you have a quality horse, but the other half of it is the training. It is insane how important the training is. And I've been very fortunate to have some guys work here that were really good. In the polo pony, um, obviously they have to be as correct as you possibly can have them for soundness. Because if they can't, if they're not sound, they can't play, obviously. But they also, they play a season. They play a long, hard season, so they have to have durability. But the first thing I look for is their brain, their temperament. They have to be as quiet as you want, as you can. The polo pony needs to run fast, but it needs to have a very efficient stride. We don't want them to have a big galloping motion. We want them to have a quick running gallop, a rare, very quick, fast run, but so they can stop and turn. This is a picture of a stud for polo. He's little, but he puts out a bigger baby. You know what I mean? And they have to have a temperament like this. I hadn't been on him in 11 years, and they came to film a picture of him for um, um, American Polo Horse, Sport Horse. And I got on him with the halter down here in bareback. And he hadn't been sat on in 11 years, and he's just one of those great, his temperament on his folds are wonderful, and that's what sells him. Most of these mares are out of very high goal. All their mothers, the highest you can play is 26 goal right now. And, Oh, uh, I think all of these mares, all of these babies, their mothers have played 26 goal. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking at all of them, yeah. Or, or they've been played by a high goal player. Uh, every now and then you fold one out that isn't right, something's wrong, and, or they don't like pull them, and you teach them something else. We've got, we've got a roping horse, we've got many hunters and jumpers. You, Bighorn Polo Club is one of the best places in the world to have your young horses because they they cater to the young horse and the green horse and you can like I said you can get them scared you can you can mess them up or you can do it right you know and luckily we have a lot of people here doing it right. Polo in the Bighorn area has been here since 1892 it is the oldest club now in the United States it used to be the oldest club west of the Mississippi
Polo is a sport, and they always say, well, think of it as hockey on horseback. Well, kind of. It's four people to a side. Obviously, the, the job is to make a goal, but to obtain possession of the ball, your horse has to take you to the play and ride off the other player, or you hook him. You, you know, there are a lot of different skills you can have to get the, um, the job done. Um, quite fun. The horses love to play and they learn to follow the ball. And you could take a bridle off of some horses and they would play the game. They know their position, they know what they're supposed to do. It's quite evil. <laughs> um, polo has a kind of a funny reputation for being, oh, rich man sport or haughty, and it's not at all. It's a very, it's a blast. Once you get on and find out how much fun it is to hit the ball and you're like a, you're like that horse is your teammate, it's your partner, uh, and you have a good chucker, um, you get hooked on it. I've done a lot of other things. Show jumping, they love to jump. I've done a little bit of barrel racing, the good ones love to run barrels. So I think it's any any time you get on an animal that absolutely loves what they're doing. And uh, as I've said, it's a skill. And the value of a polo pony doesn't go up and down, it stays up because of the value that it gives to the game. I would say the horse is 75 to 90% of your game. You can be a great hitter, you can ride really well, but if you can't get to the ball because your horse is afraid or doesn't understand how to do it, well, you can't play the game. You've got to have that horse suit a person. You can't sell a horse just because somebody wants it. And that's kind of what's fun about selling them. If they like the game, maybe they're not fast, but they'll suit one player. Maybe they're not big and they'll suit this player. Maybe they're big and fast and they'll suit this player. So it's kind of fun to sell them and, and you want people to want more of your horses. It is the, the, the person who puts in the most time and effort at what they do is gonna be noticed faster, you know? So it helps to have to work three times as hard as everybody else, but because you like it, it becomes, it isn't hard work. It's your, you love it, you don't work a day in your life.